Hey there, comic book friends. I'm Travis, and this is another edition of No Capes, where I talk about the comic books that don't have to do with superheroes and or Ethan doesn't read them or review them along with me. These are for books for the last week of June of 2013. Um, quite a really good lot of books. Let's jump right into it with uh, BPRD Vampire issue four of five. Um, we get to see Anders go full power here. He's obviously possessed by some really nasty stuff. It's a battle between witches and vampires and, um, and lost loves um, from times way back. And um, I'm enjoying the book. It's, I, it's not the strongest of all of the BPRD um, Hellboy Universe books, um, I don't think. Um, but I absolutely love the artwork. Um, the twins, Gabriel Bra and Fabio Moon, do awesome artwork. I like their storytelling abilities. Um, this just isn't the most in-depth um, story, but I like Anders. I like Agent Anders, and it's really cool to um, see what's been eating at him after reading the whole uh, 1984 um, miniseries. To have him here, hopefully he's addressing some stuff. He's going to get some stuff worked out of his system. It's either going to be the end of him or it's um, he's going to be able to move on from it. I, I guess we'll find out in the next issue. Uh, but um, enjoyable uh, Dark Horse book, none the same. Um, if you are picking up, you're curious about it, obviously now's the time to wait for trade unless you can find him something, send him someplace for some good deal. But anyway, the PRD Vampire, fun stuff. Great book, uh, Fatale. This is um, issue 15. Um, this hits a soft spot in my heart because this is set in Seattle. I don't live in Seattle, but I live in the state of Washington. But it's set in the late 80s, early 90s, the kind of grunge era. Um, this is my era. This is when I was in my um, um, young adult years. Uh, lived a lot of, of this world in in some sense or another so um it plays into stuff for me personally because of that um i appreciate it if you read the back matter in this ed brubaker also comes from that that space too he kind of writes this story he as a young adult was in seattle um and and lived the life that was there at the time and, and that sort of thing and um so this kind of it revolves around kind of his friends. I mean, obviously the story itself, Josephine, that stuff was never there. We would assume his friends weren't rock and roll star, or rock and roll um, people like they are in this book. But still, it captures the feeling of that. I'm excited for for that. Um, I, we've had these one shots. They were fun. I'm looking forward to us getting into another longer arc. Looking forward to this because this is, puts us in another arc again. We get our original character back. You know he's struggling to try and, um, and and deal with things. He's he's going to court. He's already been in jail for all these years, waiting for his trial date. Going up on murder charges. A jander busts him out of the courthouse. They're on the run now. And of course, this jander has met Josephine in the past, and that's why he's doing the crazy stuff he's doing. Um, I think it's going to be another interesting run of stuff. Really excited by it. Like I said, uh, grunge era Seattle. That's just cool uh, for me personally, uh, but a good story. Starting of another arc, um, and um, just really enjoyable, cool stuff from this book. Um, more of the same, which is great. Next, we'll talk Five Ghosts. This is um, issue four of five. Um, yeah, number four of five. Awesome cover. Love the um, colors here, the color scheme. Um, the, the ghosts, the five ghosts are grappling with him and they've got tentacles on him and he's being pulled down. The basis of the story here is at this point he's on like this soul journey trial. Uh, the four ghosts are, um, are putting him um, through some tests to see if um, he's worthy of something, of going out the other end of it and, and being able to use these ghosts without them using him so much and him losing control is I think where we're at. Um, I will say, you know, be, to be quite honest, there's not a lot of story in this issue. There's not a lot of content as far as um, uh, moving large portions of the story forward. Um, 
but this is a very fun story. Uh, all the same, the, the art in it is just great. It's just fun. It's got this really great kind of old something about it, kind of old time feeling to it. Um, and I'm really enjoying that. I keep hearing rumors from other people on YouTube that this has been picked up as an ongoing, I can't find anywhere on the internet that says that's the case. So if somebody can find it, please point me to a link somehow. Let me know where it says that this is actually going to be an ongoing. I wouldn't be surprised because I can't imagine how much story they're going to finish off in one more issue. That they're not going to go with like another mini series and then another mini series and another mini series. That makes sense. But I haven't seen anything that actually says that yet. So any of you guys out there who if you've seen it somewhere that it's not pure rumor mill, um, let me know because I'm really curious. I'm, I'm excited if that's the case. I'm looking forward to it because I'm not sure how much bigger story they're going to be able to tell us in just one issue. So there is that. But lots of fun, really cool. If you haven't been picking this up, obviously there's one more issue yet. Jump on the trade as soon as the trade hits. You'll enjoy it. I think it'll be a really, really fun trade. Three. Jupiter's Legacy, Jupiter's Legacy number two. Of course, this is a every other month uh, book. So you have to remember what you read the last time, which really wasn't a problem for me. I was interested in what was happening last time. I'm still really interested in this book, surprisingly to me. Not a uh, fan of uh, Mark Millar's uh, work as a general rule, I don't think. Um, things like Kick-Ass and stuff like that don't appeal to me. This is really interesting. Interesting on a couple different um, levels. One, in this, this man proposes a way to fix our financial woes because basically in this reality, they're at the worst financial crisis part of the world uh, of, of the United States that we were a few years ago. Um, and that's really interesting. And it's interesting, the, the argument between him and our main character, who I've drawn a blank on what his name actually is right now. He's kind of the Superman type character. He's the, the first superhero kind of a guy. And... Um, he does not want him meddling in um, government affairs. And so there's this you know, definite rift between them and an argument between old school thought and new school thought, which I think is really interesting. Um, last issue, of course, we had um, uh, the first family of superheroes. The daughter had OD'd on some alien drugs. We find her in the hospital. We get a surprise about her, not only with the drug overdose, but some other issues that she has going on. Those felt relatively stereotypical, and and we find out that she's dating like the son of the worst supervillain. Um, I don't know what I think of that part of it yet. Uh, that seems fairly stereotypical, and I don't know how they're going to play with that to make it different. Because the rest of this book kind of feels like they're playing on, you know, they're kind of going after some of the superhero tropes, which I, I kind of like. Um, the other thing that's happening here is this guy, who of course after having his argument with this big, powerful, you know, number one head honcho superhero, goes to said son, who gets humiliated in this book um, by his dad, goes to that son and goes, you know what, I think it's time for us to take care of your dad. And I think you're the only person that's going to actually be able to do it. Can you do it? Are you, are you with us? So he's kind of instigating a coup of sorts, of the potentially of the superheroes. And I think that's going to be really interesting to read. Um, Fabulous Art, of course, continues um, by Frank Quietly. I just kind of a bummer that this book is every other month. Um, hard to collect it in singles when it does that, um, just because of the length of time between between each issue to keep all the plot threads together and whatnot. I mean, if it's a good book, it should be able to keep those, and I pretty much can. But it might this might be a better read and a trade just because you will be able to consume it all in one to all in one time. But I did really enjoy this issue. Um, Looking forward to the next issue. I'm on board for now, um, whereas I was kind of waiting to see what issue two is going to be like to determine whether that was going to be the case. So I am on board. I'm interested to see what kind of a, a story we are going to tell about kind of a legacy of superheroes and what's the next generation going to do with these powerful people who have been in place all this time. Um, so some interesting stuff that's going to be going on there. Lazarus, number one. Been waiting for this comic since I got to see the advanced preview of it in March at Emerald City Comic Con. Um, girl on the cover there, her name is Forever. This book starts out with her being basically shot, what seems to be a death, and then she comes back to life and um, beats a bunch of people up. Basically, this book is set somewhere in a near future 
um, the rich corporate families have taken over um, the world, basically. They run everything. They are the government. Um, and they all have their own personal governments, basically, within them. The family runs these things. They have paramilitary people. Um, the place is kind of a dark and miserable place, it seems. The common folk that are just trying to survive and make it to the next day are basically referred to as waste. They are referred to as waste. The actual wage slaves, people who actually have a purpose to create, make, maintain uh, the stuffs for the families. Um, what were they called? I can't remember now. It was a relatively derogatory term also. Um, not the waste, but something along those along those lines. And um, But the book has to do with forever. She's a Lazarus. Each family has their own Lazarus. This person is basically, they're kind of an assassin for the family to take care of um, uh, of whatever. Um, serfs. That's what they're called. The, the common folk that actually do the work is called serfs. There's the family, there's the serfs, and there's the waste. Um, but um, <clears throat> forever is a basically a hitman. She's obviously um, doped up on all kinds of um, genetic enhancements to um, heal quickly and stuff like that. She's having, in this first issue, she's having some moral dilemmas with um, the approach that she takes to dealing with these people. She's questioning that. And her, her um, physician uh, also seems to be somebody who deals with the psychology also. Uh, they basically are working on a cocktail to make it to where she doesn't have that moral um, questioning there, um, which I find all that really interesting. Now, there have been some people who have asked some really interesting questions on the internet um, about where does her morals come from? If she's grown up with this being the norm, with the family, the serfs, and the waste, and that's all she's ever known, why would she feel an obligation to the waste or the serfs? Why would she feel bad for killing some guys that were in one of the family homes, robbing them of everything, and then the person tried killing her, her killing them, why would she feel bad about that? Why would she have that? And I just, I'm curious about that too. Uh, Greg Ruck has done some interviews. He won't really say. I, I'm curious to see if part of what Greg is going to talk about here, Mr. Ruck is going to talk about in here, is, is the whole morality of human beings. Are you, are you born with that morality? Is that where it's coming from with her? I mean, is it just something that somewhere we all as humans have empathy towards other humans and 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 all of that or what you know i'm curious I'm, uh, that to me is an interesting story uh beyond this awesome horrific dark future of of corporate takeover and power and the one percent having so much that they do have and the rest the 99 percent having barely anything or worse uh, really good comic. This isn't a miniseries. Greg Rucka, the writer, and the artist um, um, Lark are talking about 70 plus issues of, of comics. I'm excited by that. Um, I think we're going to get to see a lot of awesome, grim, cool things in here. By the way, the family motto, they have a motto on their helicopter and all the uniforms and everything. It's Latin. I can't remember what the Latin is right now. But the basic translation is um, is what was it? I am going to walk away from this camera for just a second. Excuse me. I know I don't really want to do this. But I got it written down because I want to remember what it was and I forgot it. And I am back. And it is, the translation is, let them hate so long as they fear. That's their family motto. Let them hate so long as they fear. Look that up sometime. Who, who else uses that motto? It's kind of interesting. You know, it's a political book, kind of. I don't know that it's really political or not. Um, you can interpret it that way if you want to. The whole 1%, 99%. Uh, but very, very good book. Very excited by it. Excellent first issue, I thought. The Massive. And this is issue 13. Um, we're almost halfway through this series. This series is actually going to be 30 issues long. Um, here we are in New York. Always interesting when Brian Wood 
uh, writes anything about New York because that's his home. Um, you know, he wrote 72 issues of DMZ, which all had to do with uh, New York, Manhattan uh, area. Uh, and here, Manhattan is pretty much almost completely underwater except for skyscrapers sticking out. Um, so that's all really interesting kind of stuff. Um, our submarine that was stolen um, four or five issues ago suddenly shows up here um, and some really bad stuff is happening. Um, the submarine is there. It's a nuclear submarine. You can take your own implications for what could possibly happen if somebody's cruising around the nuclear submarine and they're cruising it right into Manhattan. Uh, the United States is a disaster, um, considering the fact that most of the United States, most of its population, most of its money, and most of all that kind of stuff sets on the West Coast or the East Coast, and both the West Coast and the East Coast basically went into the ocean. So um, most of the United States is dark, um, but they still have their military in some sense, and they protect their borders and their sovereignty very viciously in this future. And so, of course, when the capital shows up here, so do a bunch of helicopters and the military, basically saying that they're going to blow them out of the water if they are not, if they don't give up. And that's where the book kind of ends. But a lot of interesting stuff between it. I guess some really crazy stories are going to happen here pretty soon. Still really enjoying um, the massive. I like Gary Brown's art. He's a great artist for this book. Uh, and of course, Jody Belair, who I keep commenting about as far as colorist. Her color schemes in this are excellent. These grays and then the other tones, um, depending on what the mood and, and where they're at in the ship and, and across the, um, the world. Um, quite excellent. Quite excellent. Next, uh, those of you who um, watched me on um, a comic book roundtable this last week know I talked a little bit about this book, um, Sex, Issue 4. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about it here. I didn't like it. I, I think it's wasting our time um, uh, and, and our money. Um, it's not getting to any point whatsoever in it. It's just kind of milling around. There are very, very small things in this that might potentially be interesting, uh, some potentially interesting characters. Otherwise, you want to slap this guy, just tell him to shut up because he's a drag. Um, the whole naming it sex, as I've talked about before, is kind of bullshit. Um, you know, that's just to generate sales. And I hoped that they were actually going to talk about something. And they're not. They're not talking about anything really in this book. Or they're taking so long to talk about it that nobody cares that, that I know of. I mean, hell, even in the back matter in this thing, he doesn't even know what to talk about. So um, pretty disappointing. Pretty disappointing in, the, in this book, the way they pitched it um, in solicitations to start out with and what it act in reality actually is really to me feel like two different things and so yeah that's all i'm going to talk about it disappointing book and finally um the week issue two um excellent book i, I really enjoyed the first issue wasn't sure exactly where we're going to go with it uh, this issue it just opens the doors up to all kinds of awesomeness there's theories in here about this this merman that potentially he is um, he's an ancestor of humans that at some point way back um, humans had two choices some went to the land some went back to the ocean and maybe that's why we're as developed as we are that we took some time back in the ocean again and then came back on the land again um, all kinds of interesting stuff like that there's some great pictures in here of these kind of webbed fingered um, cavemen of sorts using a mammoth as bait for a giant megalodon shark to come up and try and eat the the um the woolly mammoth that's been killed and then chucking thousands of spears at this thing as this entire community pulls down this shark and harvests it and then maybe that's what this thing is that this may be that this is like the linchpin creature for all kinds of mythology that we've had throughout time the sirens because this thing has this kind of whale song kind of thing that's putting out and it seems to be making people hallucinate um, all kinds of craziness goes in here the guy in the first issue that was mauled really badly he hallucinates that he his wife is there he, i think he ends up while in a hallucinatory state all injured releasing this creature that they have captured in this underwater um um under, underwater base lets him loose the rest of them start hallucinating um, 
this stuff. I think it's this song that he's playing, which is kind of like a siren song, is messing with them all. At the end, we get another slice of what I'm assuming is the future. Our person with the cybernetic dolphin. It looks like the moon is exploding. God knows what that does to the oceans if we certainly don't have a moon anymore as far as the tides and all that kind of stuff. Um, but just really, really exciting, really, really interesting. Um, Murphy is becoming more and more an artist I just really, really like. Um, excellent, excellent work. Interesting lines, interesting storytelling, very dynamic, great facial features um, to convey what is going on in these people's heads and whatnot. Just a really great book. And really, other than, um, other than uh, the stupid issue of sex, um, excellent week. It was a really great week of comics all in all. An excellent week for um, no cape books. Um, so yeah, pretty excited. Check out some of those books. Um, and like I said, if you know about the, um, the Five Ghosts, the ongoing, if you can find some place on the internet or somewhere that tells me that it's an ongoing in some sense, um, let me know because I really appreciate that. Or anything else about any of these books that you know that I don't know or I haven't said or that I'd find interesting because hey, that's what we're here about is to talk about these books. Um, Anyway, thanks for listening to me go on and on, and I will catch you later on in the week uh, with more comic talk of some sort or another. Bye.